out there, which is good. Uh, I'm up here not as a Coast Guard, well, partially as a Coast Guard member, but mostly as uh, a member of the Board of Directors for ISPI. And it's my, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's uh, my privilege to uh, do the introduction for today's master's uh, session. So, Rear Admiral Sullivan assumed the duty of Commander Force Readiness Command in June 2009. And this is in addition to his position as Deputy Commander of the Pacific Area. Force Comp maintains sole responsibility for the current and future readiness of the entire Coast Guard workforce. Prior to standing up Force Comp, he was Commander, Maintenance and Logistics Command Pacific, First Coast Guard District Commander, and Commander, Maritime Defense Command. He served as the Senior Military Advisor to the Secretary of Homeland Security as the primary coordinator between the Department of Defense and Homeland Security, as well as Operational Advisor to the Secretary during Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. His shipboard commands include the Coast Guard Cutter Malo in Honolulu and Coast Guard Cutter Juniper, homeported in Newport, Rhode Island, where he had the distinction of being the first plank loader commanding officer. A native of Milwaukee, Rear Admiral Sullivan graduated from the Coast Guard Academy in 1975 and earned a master's degree in communications, art, public affairs from Cornell University. He is also a graduate of Harvard University Kennedy School of Government, Senior Executive, National and International Program. ISBI is honored to have Rear Admiral Tim Sullivan present a master's session and to show our appreciation, we have a small plaque for you, sir. Rear Admiral Timothy Sullivan. Thanks, it's been a great afternoon. Uh, carry on, we'll see you later. <laughs> Got the flat, I'm in. Uh, one of the things I realize is uh, I'm between all of you, especially so many trustees, and a cold beer. Uh, nonetheless, maybe a dinner someplace. So I'm going to try to keep this uh, hopefully interesting, pretty easy. Pretty dark on my podium, but otherwise fine. Uh, I'd like to uh, first of all thank ISBI um, for really the privilege of, of being asked to attend here. I know it's a, a master's uh, presentation. I'm a little humbled by that. Uh, I'm certainly uh, not a master's in most thing I do. Just ask my wife; uh, she'll let you know that. Um, but I have become a great proponent of HBT. Let me give you a little bit about my background, and then uh, we're going to have a, a little bit of interest. Uh, most of my time in the Coast Guard, I've been in operations. Uh, for uh, many of you, that's kind of uh, what you know, mean by operations. Well, started out uh, in uh, various Coast Guard cutter ships that we have. Had the opportunity to do that. Had some uh, chance to travel and do uh, uh, aids navigation, search and rescue, a lot of things. If you hang around 35 years in the Coast Guard, you get a chance to see and do a lot. I've uh, had a chance to do that in the far reaches of the Pacific, uh, islands of Saipan, uh, where I was uh, Lieutenant JG, then became the Commonwealth of the United States. I uh, had a chance to meet Jimmy Carter's son, one of your favorites, um, and really, you know, really grew up, both myself and my spouse at that time, get a chance to see uh, different parts of the world, tra travel all over Asia and so forth at the same time. Um, Came out of the uh, great seafaring state of cows and sailors, Wisconsin. Uh, I know many of you uh, can think of uh, the sea in Wisconsin. Cheese, <laughs> the peppers, sailors. Um, but actually, uh, one of the uh, chances I had, uh, one of my first tours was actually on the Great Lakes. So, for all, anybody from the Great Lakes area, excellent, you know what I'm talking about. Fresh water, short periods. Probably the biggest seas I've ever been in, and I've had a chance to sail a good part of the oceans of the world, have been on the Great Lakes. The day the Edmund Fitzgerald went down, some of you recall the Gordon Lightfoot song, uh, I was out on that search and rescue case. I was an ensign, I was at, I remember at a height of 35 feet, I'm looking up at waves well over my head, going, I'm going to die, I'm seasick, this five years in the Coast Guard is going to be way too long. Um, had a chance to do a lot of things since then. 
as was mentioned, very nice by David in the bio, is again, if you've been around long enough, you get a chance to do a lot of things. I'm going to touch on a couple of things this afternoon. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, obviously, uh, HBT and how that's affected probably both me personally as well as the customer. Because uh, as it turns out, uh, the time frame is about the same for both. I'm a check my notes sort of guy, so I'm going to probably wander back and forth between the podium and speaking to you. Um, one of the biggest things uh, that Dave mentioned that uh, that I'm really fortunate to be involved in besides being here is part of our new force readiness command. It's the first time that we've taken the opportunity to take all of our training centers, a look at our doctrine, look at how we um, uh, look at each particular unit and combine those kind of three things together. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon. I very much look forward to some of your questions and concerns on that. Uh, it's taken, uh, it's the first time, I think, in almost 220 year history that we've done it. Uh, ForceCon currently has a seven uh, different training centers, two traveling training teams, uh, Coast Guard staffs at the five afloat training groups, which is where we uh, figure out to make sure our ships are assessed and doing well. Coast Guard Institute training quota man uh, management center, uh, multiple liaison officers at DOD training facilities, uh, subordinate commands span the entire country. We have people in New Jersey, uh, Virginia, a great, another great seafaring state of Oklahoma, uh, all the way out to, uh, to uh, Hawaii. Uh, we also look at the operational doctrine uh, and development shops and standardization, as I mentioned, uh, which uh, together are really responsible, actually, for a uh, performance and readiness within the Coast Guard. Uh, we have systems supporting work for workforce performance, uh, doctrine development, as I mentioned, and then the feedback loops uh, as to how that all works. I'm coming up on my uh, 36th year in the Coast Guard. I'm giving serious thought to making a career at this job. Uh, it's kind of interesting when you look back at it, though, there's been a really uh, a certain amount of symmetry uh, between uh, my career and the evolution of HBT, at least in the Coast Guard. It's something I hadn't really thought of before. Uh, I certainly can't take credit uh, by saying uh, I had the foresight to get involved in HBT as a junior officer or anything, I'd be lying to you. Uh, I, I kind of wish I had done. Uh, what I can say that is throughout my career, I really had a chance, uh, oftentimes of not even known about it, is practicing HBT. Uh, now, as much as I'm uh, older, wiser, some of my staff would say grayer, uh, I have had experiences to understand the essence of really the instructional uh, system design and human performance technology. I understand the methodologies. I really have a appreciate the tremendous value that it brings to both me personally and to our service. Uh, human performance has really grown up in the Coast Guard, again, with me. Uh, during my years of service, I've really seen some huge positive impacts uh, that the performance technology has uh, in parts of many different assets of the service. Uh, the efforts and innovations that many of you in the HBT community uh, have quite fundamentally changed the way we do business in the Coast Guard. It's just been a huge change. Uh, the Coast Guard, and I see probably too many blue suitors, but uh, a number of you obviously that aren't definitely with the service. As I go around, I find out probably uh, there's not as many folks that, uh, that know that much about the Coast Guard. Uh, we have 11 statutory missions. Uh, you've heard and seen many of them. It's uh, search and rescue. Uh, we have a lot uh, on that kind of end of the spectrum, law enforcement, uh, drug enforcement, uh, defense operations. Duck scrubber is kind of on the other side. That's a, that's a happy term for us. Oil pollution cleanup, uh, we do a lot of that. Aids and navigation, uh, like I said, defense operations, ice breaking. Not a lot of ice, by the way, here in San Francisco. We're doing a really good job. Probably a, a, a better way, though, I think, uh, rather than talk about too much about what we do, is I have my staff look at a couple different options. I said, you know, they, a lot of these people aren't going to know that much about the Coast Guard. Let's, let's give them a little taste of it. So we came up with a couple different videos. Now this is a kind of where we need a little audience participation here. Because uh, we had uh, two different versions that we looked at. Uh, there's uh, one that's uh, loaded on the computer already. It's kind of about the four and a half minute rock and roll kind of hard hitting slideshow. Kind of one of those. And then I have about the seven minute, actually we'll tell you something about the cut skirt. So, 
the four minute rock and roll one, that's kind of gives you a little bit. What do you think? Boat? Okay. Some uncertainties. Kind of the seven and a half minute, a little bit more about the coaster. Yeah, well, I'm not like a bunch of rock and roll guys, so we're going with the <laughs> we're going with the longer version. Let's see if this comes up. It promised me it would. It's a good time if you need to get a coat, make a head call, check out. It's coming up, right? I did this with space work. smart card 
that contains an individual's biometric information. In times of conflict, we proudly serve alongside the Navy and Marine Corps. Our cutters accompany naval battle groups around the world, providing unique expertise for peacetime and wartime operations, ranging from port security to boarding commercial vessels. We serve as powerful role models to many of the world's maritime nations that conduct similar missions. As a key participant in operations enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom, we conduct maritime interception operations and coastal security patrols. Our expertise in small boat handling, maritime law enforcement, and non-compliant boarding tactics enable us to train the Iraqi Navy and Marines. Overfishing has dramatically depleted fish stocks worldwide, forcing fisheries to find new resources and exploit existing ones more ruthlessly. The U.S. Exclusive Economic Zone, EEZ, which extends 200 miles out from our shores, is a primary target since it includes some of the most productive fishing grounds in the world. To preserve this important resource, we patrol the more than 3 million square miles of the EEZ enforcing laws designed to protect both our fishing industry and the marine environment. Stewardship also means maintaining the vessel traffic services system, which coordinates the safe movement of commercial vessels through congested harbors and waterways, while protecting critical habitat and shorelines. Another aspect of this mission is our critical ice-breaking ability that keeps shipping lanes open for commercial traffic in the winter. As we serve our great nation, we continue to implement new initiatives with strategic intent. In 2007, the U.S. Coast Guard Strategy for Maritime Safety, Security, and Stewardship was signed by the Commonwealth. The strategy takes a comprehensive look at the current and future challenges within the maritime field and establishes strategic priorities for the Coast Guard to address these issues. Recapitalizing and modernizing the Coast Guard through more capable interoperable aircraft, cutters, and command centers will allow us to perform our demanding missions more effectively, efficiently, and safely. For our highly trained, highly dedicated men and women, active duty, reservists, civilian employees, and auxiliarists, always ready is more than a model. It is a way of life. We proudly continue our long tradition of honor, respect, and devotion to do. We are proud to serve the citizens of the United States. We are America's Maritime Guard. Okay, who's ready to join? <laughs> uh, you guys are blue suits, that doesn't count. You're in. Um, I, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but there's a reason I want to give you a little bit of background, not to necessarily get you to join the Coast Guard, but you can see uh, how many different varied things we do. On any given day, uh, we assist 192 people in distress, respond to 109 search and rescue cases. You might have seen uh, this morning on one of the well blowouts down the Gulf Coast as we had uh, Coast Guard folks out there. Save over $2.8 million of property, seized $9.6 million worth of drugs, respond to 20 oil or other hazardous chemical spills on a daily basis, seven days, 365 days of work. So, notice to say, I've kind of drunk the Kool-Aid. I'm really proud of our sailors and our airmen, all the logisticians, all the support staff, all our guardians that you can see in that movie really stand to watch throughout the world. And are really internationally recognized as probably being certainly not only the best Coast Guard in the world, but probably one of the best banks for the buck. You get all that, and we get all that as taxpayers for an organization that's about 50,000 people. That's smaller than the New York Police Department. That's 95,000 miles of shoreline that we take a look at every day in the, in the United States. Uh, that's why, again, you mentioned that our motto is kind of semper broadus, always ready. Uh, that's something that we really have to live up to. Uh, like it or not, uh, our organization has very limited resources. We realize that to prepare, prepare us to meet our mission safely and competently on a day-to-day -day basis. The, we don't really have the luxury, uh, not that probably any of you do, but in your organizations, of throwing more money 
uh, more people at every problem that presents itself. Uh, we don't have the capacity to let's shut down the division today because uh, uh, they can't compete. Uh, Fortune 500 companies may be able to do that. I can tell you we certainly can't. Uh, our 11 missions are statutory. Uh, they're the real deal. Uh, we must repair uh, all of our members, uh, those few members that we have, with obviously a very diverse set of knowledge. We have to give them the capabilities and know how to be able to perform a spectrum of really wildly different looking tasks. Sometimes that spans for a few terrifying moments, and some that goes on for days and days. Uh, a couple examples of that, besides what you probably saw in the Gulf this morning, is uh, we had people that were on routine um, patrol down in the Caribbean uh, when the Haitian earthquake uh, hit, and we had uh, young men and women in the Coast Guard that uh, had just graduated out of boot camp, uh, which is uh, one of my commands, uh, in Cape May, New Jersey, or had just come in from uh, Officer Candidate School or the Coast Guard Academy. Uh, brand new folks in the Coast Guard, basic CPR, basic uh, first aid training. Uh, they're the first uh, U.S. Um, outside the island experience in Haiti, and, and they are doing uh, crisis medical management for about the first three days until somebody else can get there. Uh, you, you can't train for you know, that sort of uh, exigency all the time. Uh, at the same time, uh, we, uh, I had a chance along with some of my staff to do uh, H1N1 uh, interagency response uh, for our country. Uh, I had to do it throughout the Pacific. At the same time, we had people working with the Canadians uh, to help them prepare for the Winter Olympics because uh, a lot of their models venues are, are obviously on the water. Uh, I had a chance, uh, uh, it was mentioned, uh, one of our cutters, uh, the Juniper, uh, we were out, brand new cutter, had just uh, driven home, if you will, from the Great Lakes. We're out doing a training and evaluation of the vessel as the first of the new class. I'll touch a little bit on that later. But we're out in uh, New York Harbor, uh, 10, 11 years ago now, uh, doing that. And uh, if you recall, the TWA Flight 800 on a, on a hot, sultry day off Long Island, crashes from 13,000 feet. Uh, we became the on-scene commander uh, for the first 10 days. How do you train a crew? How do you prepare, you know, hire good people, train a crew, and then be able to respond to something that you thought was going to be routine today? And we do that for both our officers and enlisted, and all of a sudden they have to get into kind of a catastrophic, you know, catastrophic response. That's, a, again, a little bit of what I'd like to touch on this afternoon. But that's why, you know, quite frankly, human performance technology uh, and the Coast Guard have got such a robust relationship. Uh, if you have got to have an organization that can move on a dime and pick up uh, not only one of those statutory missions, but then have to be able to change gears very quickly, you want folks that uh, understand HPT. My grandfather always told me, probably like many of you, is to work smarter, not harder. And HPT, for that reason, again, is a very natural fit for the Coast Guard. Uh, or I think any organization as far as that matters. Uh, with the perspective that HPT uh, principles affords us, we can certainly uh, see past symptoms of challenges we face and then again identify, as you know, the root causes. Uh, though we focus on human performance, uh, we don't assume that the problem can always be fixed by training. And that's certainly one of the challenges that I have in my current job. Well, we just got to get better training to fix it. And uh, not necessarily the case. And certainly by keeping the end in mind, uh, eliminating tasks, that don't really lead to what you really need to gain to be able to do some of those missions. Uh, we can develop uh, not only comprehensive training and sometimes very uh, comprehensive non-training solution sets to be able to get to that end. In other words, by tying everything back to accomplishing uh, mission execution, which is what we're really about in our service, uh, who at times, I think, again, without sorry, uh, poor mouth, has less resources necessary to address its statutory responsibilities, it really empowers us to be able to do some of that. The system's perspective allows us to find the most efficient intervention, which often includes working with our other interagency partners. We realize in most instances the Coast Guard can't do the job and so that we're going to have to rely on you, local government, uh, state government, uh, the local police and fire to get our job done. That system's perspective really allows us to find the most uh, efficient intervention. Uh, sometimes, again, we really need to work uh, a lot smarter and less, a lot less harder than we do. As a taxpayer, it's certainly to me, I think that's good for all of us. Uh, 
uh, our 11 different and very unique missionaries that you see <coughs> excuse me, uh, require our organization to be able to deliver a competent service uh, to providers again throughout the nation and oftentimes internationally. That requires the ability to customize interventions, deliver uh, performance enhancing uh, products, and training so our men and women can really succeed. Uh, some of the ways that we do that, at least within uh, the uh, command that I'm in right now, is uh, we're looking at a lot of different simulators, as many of you are, uh, especially when you're dealing with law enforcement, small arms. Uh, you don't want to be throwing a lot of lead around uh, in California or Washington or any place on the West Coast. So we're doing more and more with simulators. We have helicopter simulators. Uh, we have a, a brand new uh, series of cutters that we are we've got simulators up in Petaluma, California, just off the way here. And uh, we're looking for the possibility of actually combining uh, most of those simulators synergistically together. Uh, our aviation training centers down in Mobile, Alabama, they've got uh, outstanding uh, both hands-on, how-to-fly helicopter type simulators. We want to be able to take off from Mobile, Alabama and essentially land on that simulator uh, in San Francisco Bay via the, uh, the simulator up in uh, right at the way of Petaluma, California. Uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, in uh, Chris Hall's command up in Petaluma also, we have demonstration kitchens. It's like uh, kitchen wars or some of those workings that we see on TV. Uh, very high tech uh, video, so because uh, if you're going to do the sort of things we do in the Coast Guard, you want to really eat well and you want to uh, eat uh, healthy. So we have people that are, are learning you know, that aspect at the same time. Uh, we're doing a lot of work out of interagency operations center. In fact, the new one's being built uh, right here in San Francisco. We've got a number of models, uh, San Diego, Charleston, other places, where again, you're going to get that natural integration. I joined the Coast Guard in 71. Uh, uh, I joined a lot of it because it seems to me that the service best reflected on how I really wanted to contribute both in my life to my country. Um, going out to sea, uh, saving lives, providing comfort to those that were often cold, wet, and scared. Those were things, I think, that, for, at least for me, uh, that really made up my mind, really made a difference for what we do. Uh, and, you know, without sounding too uh, jaded, it really, I think, could make the world a better place. Uh, and if you allow me just to uh, indulge for a second, uh, it's so exceptional uh, that I, I find that about 99, 99 percent of the people that I have a chance to work with in the Coast Guard came in for about the same reason. Uh, they wanted to stand and watch, participate in our society, be part of a service that is honored and respected, both peace and war. We don't train every day, we do that kind of stuff every day. Uh, and our people, quite frankly, no matter what kind of system they have, we really have to have people to it possibly. But, uh, around the same time that I joined, interesting enough, was uh, what eventually became uh, uh, performance technology was being developed by Florida State University on the edge of instructional design in cooperation with some of our sister services, some of which are represented here today. So while I was saving it, uh, sailing in the Pacific and, and later working in uh, D.C., uh, I was oftentimes using, as I mentioned to start with, this kind of my gut instincts, uh, literally sometimes on the back of a napkin to try to improve things, I think, like all of us do, uh, help those uh, around me, my units, and so forth. Uh, about the same time I was doing that, the Coast Guard was smart enough to start sending uh, students off the HBT training. From there, the graduates went back in the field. Uh, at the time, it was kind of a graduate here, a graduate there, plunk them in. Um, HBT graduates came back at a, a various, uh, often times, disconnected jobs within the Coast Guard, sometimes within training. Uh, and that was the way our relationship in human performance technology really uh, came to the Coast Guard. Our students who studied with luminaries such as uh, Allison Ross at San Diego State, Roger Kaufman and John Keller at Florida State, Jim Pershing at in Indiana, uh, Bill Rothwell at Penn State, Dan and Dacey and uh, Steve Valacia at uh, Boise State, the home of the Blue Carpet. Uh, they came back into the Coast Guard and started to make really a big difference where they could, again, within their certain spheres of influence. And they developed a progressive models of performance improvement way ahead of their time for, quite frankly, the rest of the Coast Guard. Uh, let, me, let me give you just an example of how some of this was working. A lot of what I've done in the Coast Guard has been in aids and navigation. Buoy tending is kind of the way we call it. Um, what some of the HPT graduates started to figure out, uh, 
that was affecting me, even as kind of the mid-grade officers, is um, when you're when you're lifting up and you saw some of these days in navigation, these are multi-ton uh, big pieces of steel over your head. You're doing with often at the time very old ships. Uh, not even a crane was kind of a boom. You want to kind of know what you're doing. You got to have a big weights over your head. And oh, by the way, you're doing it on the water. Uh, so it kind of like gets your attention. So we often train to the manual. You know, safety obviously is, is very important. Um, we then do that operation. And then what we were doing is starting to capture lessons learned from that. Your ship did a little bit better than mine. You had a great idea. Uh, we'd um, incorporate that into doctrine. Uh, we had a schoolhouse then that was not only assessing that, but gathering those great ideas and then bringing it back, uh, bringing it to our panel of experts, putting it back within our, within our manuals. Uh, that was really, um, doesn't seem like rocket scientists to both of us nowadays, but it was like, wow, can you imagine if you could turn that cycle on very quickly and not only make things safer for the people out there, um, do it more expeditiously, and at the same time, is, you know, be able to carry out because you want that ship to do other things at the same time. Um, that training team is uh, is the way we really wanted to do business, uh, mainly because, as I mentioned, it's just the right way of things to do. And however, that was for a particular uh, training, one training center in a particular mission. But then uh, things started to kind of coalesce within the Coast Guard. Mid 1990s, we stood up. With Performance Technology Center, Dave and many others here are from that. Uh, their job was to start to consolidate the infrastructure, re-engineer instructional system design processes. In addition, uh, PTC was charged to create alternative deliveries for what I would consider to be travel-free training, standardized stu uh, study outputs, and lastly, uh, go figure, uh, begin to measure the impact of some of these efforts. That sounds pretty familiar, I know most of you. By the late 1990s, we began taking on large organizational studies, uh, even in-house. Uh, there were certainly challenges and successes as a result that ended up really shaping our service and the Coast Guard that's currently standing to watch. Uh, HPT was growing from playing, again, a very small role from some individuals into becoming really a respected discipline within the Coast Guard. During that same time period, uh, for me personally, I was kind of making the transition from what I would consider to be a, a mid-grade officer in the Coast Guard to a more senior officer. And it was mentioned, was given the honor of commanding one of our, uh, of our newest fleet. I think I was the guy that complained because I was in four of these older vessels that were built in the 40s, by the way. Good stuff. Uh, but were challenging, to say the least. Uh, and would, we would wander. I, I had uh, instances to go out and work aids in navigation or do fisheries experience in the Pacific. One of these 1940s vessels that started in the Pacific, by the way, as submarine tenders and, and aids navigation tenders. And you could go 10 knots. It would take you about 10 days to get to your first job. Really exciting stuff. <laughs> uh, but uh, we had a chance to use, uh, we built this new class of vessels that was kind of like going from sailing ships into something on Star Trek. Um, it was a big change for what we needed to train. I was one of those guys, again, that was used to sailing around these 1940 vessels. Now you're with vessels that can control themselves, stay within a meter anywhere in the world, sail off on an electronic chart, and go off to where you do, do a search and rescue pattern by itself. You know, take its temperature, 10,000 sensors, all the cool stuff that we kind of expect nowadays. So as needless to say, didn't necessarily get that right, right from the beginning. So I had a chance, not only as the first command officer, but to come back and work with a, a couple of members of our audience today and do what they call buoy tent assistance study. Because we started looking at it and says, do we have the right amount of people? Are they trained to come from kind of these 1940s vessels onto these comparative Star Trek vessels? Get it right. So it took us about a year uh, using uh, full-up HPT processes, which for me was, again, one of those growing pieces. We did it for about a year at the Xerox Center. Maybe you ever chance had a chance to visit the Xerox Center? Yeah. I unfortunately knew it so well that I could actually find my way around the Xerox Center. Uh, and if you've been there and you've been lost, like many of us have there, it was scary. Uh, and it was time to go on. Uh, that's just probably one example, again, where HPT was really starting to make a difference in what we're doing. Uh, the, 
she was, uh, I think there were so many other changes though that happened within the Coast Guard about the same time. Uh, but I think probably one of the biggest breakthroughs, uh, at least for the Coast Guard, uh, to understand the true power, I think, besides that uh, tender system was uh, incorporating HBT into our, I consider to be our regular business practices. And that really came as a result of a, an electronic performance support system. Uh, 1996, we awarded a contract uh, to then uh, Bollinger Shipyards to build an 87-foot coastal patrol boat. It was a kind of a one-for-one one replacement for, again, an older uh, 1950s and 60s, 82-foot uh, patrol boats. Uh, the 87-foot frame was, again, treated as kind of a one-for-one one substitution. Uh, even though this new platform that we were buying had a maintenance requirements that uh, increased about 585% over the old kind of neat small vessel that we had. To help understand the ramifications of some of this new acquisition, we had our HBT specialists conducted a front-end analysis. The analysis showed that crews could not adequately maintain the new systems. Instead of helping, again, kind of jumping to the training thing, is new schools and all this stuff, we developed an electronic performance support system. And it distributed to the fleet, did it on regularized laptops, and this allowed coasties to prepare our members to execute the mission with a really a modest expenditure up front. The estimated cost and effort return was about 11 to 1 of this, and the project won both ISPI and ASTD awards. That particular project was a breakthrough for our organization and really led us to kind of a much more open minded uh, HVT intervention of all kinds. The shift, in, the shift in mindset was uh, from a belief in the solution of all human performance deficiencies as a classroom training. And again, I know none of you have ever heard this before. To understanding that a lot of those interventions come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes that led to the utilization again of HPT and much more aspects of our service, and not just within the training field. As you can see, I think, uh, even from the video, the Coast Guard has developed a really a strong, organic HPT community capable of just about any project that we throw up, which is Really good news for me. Currently, we're analyzing and considering joint performance interventions with the Department of Homeland Security partners, and really the possibility of instilling HBT into our systems department wide within Homeland Security. Uh, I mentioned before that I was the military advisor to Secretary Chertoff and Secretary Ridge when the department first uh, started up. And one of my tasks uh, was to direct what they call the DHS second stage review. This was one of those scary moments that we all have in our professional careers. When somebody from the very high end of our organization says, could you stop down the office rent just for a minute? You're like, oh, shit, sure. what can I do for you? No, no, just bring your notepad. <laughs> okay. I'll be right there. So, rushed down there, saw the secretary, and I was, uh, this is kind of a cup and tie job for me. I'm active duty Coast Guard Admiral says, I'd like you to help me reorganize the department. Okay, uh, sure, I work a lot with the Department of Defense, Coast Guard, I, I'll work in those areas. This will be good, so we can really do a lot. No, no, Tim, I'd like you to reorganize the department. Excuse me? I'm just a lowly one-star admiral the Coast Guard. I really don't have any political affiliations. I'd kind of like to go back to the Coast Guard, sir. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly where you're going, but I don't think you want me. Mm -hmm. Well, those are all the reasons that he wanted me to do it. So, I had the opportunity to immediately pick up the phone call back a couple of my HTB buddies and say, yeah, well, I got one for you. Uh, you know, can you imagine putting together uh, 18 action teams, 250 people, uh, within the second largest department of the federal government? Uh, and by the way, if any of you are looking for like a great graduate school study, come and see me after this, because uh, it was really, really interesting. Uh, people that, uh, this was, uh, the Department of Homeland Security was kind of thrown together, uh, I shouldn't say that, but put together uh, thoughtfully uh, from a large variety of organizations. And of course, all those people had their own, own way of doing things. So it was, I was able to grab one private sector guy. Uh, uh, I had about 90 days, about $100,000 to reorganize the department. I actually worked out pretty well. We uh, ended up basing a lot of my priorities in the future on risk, go figure. Uh, Drive improvement with really a sense of urgency. Uh, came up with a new directorate uh, for policy, centralized improved policy development, Office of Intelligence Analysis. Strength of intelligence information sharing was improved. Uh, director
Director of Operations was formed, uh, Director of Preparedness was performed, and uh, we consolidated preparations across all 22 different agencies that make up DHS. And to brief this all to the Hill, get an agreement, get buy-in within all those organizations, and get it done by, started in April and finished briefing out to the Hill and had implementation in July. So, I don't want to paint an overly rosy picture of certainly our service or my background. Uh, it's not all sunshine and HPT at the Coast Guard or DHS, but our impulse still as an organization, as with many of you, is to jump right to solutions uh, without analyzing, designing, uh, evaluating. Uh, we're action-oriented people within the Coast Guard. Our service has a bias again for this action. You know, we want that quick fix, many like your organizations. Uh, instead of waiting for that measured analysis with uh, those, again, very important data-driven solutions. Our HPT staff continuously faces this challenge, not only for me, but again, for many other members of the organization. I think, uh, though, uh, this is the reason we're really successful getting HPT to flourish in the Coast Guard, because how we grew it internally. The development of HPT practitioners was not forced. Nobody said you have to do this. In fact, I would say it was a very natural and organic development for the customer. We spent the time converting uh, people to this approach and through the success of individual projects. Of course, it doesn't hurt that we have 123 coasties to uh, HBT programs uh, throughout uh, our university system and then put it right to work by graduation. We established, as I mentioned, our own, our own human performance technology conference, uh, which started as a very small internal conference held on one of our training centers within two years. Uh, we outgrew our own facilities and had to move to large events. This year we'll celebrate the 10th annual conference with attendees from DOD, DHS, private industry, academia, and even international partners. And I certainly encourage any of you to do that quick uh, internet search to find out more about it. Last year's event received the uh, SB 2009 Award for Excellence in HBT Communications by showcasing, I think, uh, probably the very best in the field of cutting edge human performance technology. This year I know our folks will continue to build on that success with a theme that I know will push the discourse forward. Uh, this year we'll challenge attendees to make the human connection, which of course for all of us is really an important part. I want to give a uh, special thanks to Commander Dave Hart and uh, Chief Doug Kraft, uh, who are so very active and involved in bringing innovations of ISPI offers to the customer. I'd also like to recognize at least some of our Coast Guard ISBI uh, advocates, like Captain uh, Marvin, Paul, Folsom, and many others, I think, here today. In fact, many of my senior trainers are here today. I'd like to put you on the spot, if you guys don't mind, for just a minute, because you look like you're sitting about too long anyway. And, and I ask all of them, all the former Coast Guard trainers, to please stand up and uh, please be recognized. Come on, you can do it. I'm pretty proud of these folks. Um, it seems that at last HBT is, is really a fully respected and at least maturing discipline within the Coast Guard. Uh, during my short uh, lifetime in uniform for our service, it has slowly, methodically adapted performance technology and it's really just kind of a standard way of doing business. Again, you can be, uh, began with a couple of graduates, individual efforts at separate training centers, grew into a performance technology center, which has really enabled us to utilize HBT principles throughout our service. The idea of a single command charged with ensuring performance using world-class instructional system design has been around since our courtship of HPT. And with the Forest Readiness Command, which is less than a year old, again, which I have the honor of commanding, we have now a single point of leadership that's enabling the unit of effort that, quite frankly, we've never seen in any of our training systems. We've got the right skills to each component of our workforce to do all those very jobs. Let me say again how very flattered I have been uh, to ask uh, to be able to speak here today. I hope you learned just a little bit about more about what we do in the Coast Guard. Um, the International Society for Performance Improvement is a really a venerable institution that has been a really a leading advocate for most effective principles of human creativity and competence throughout the world. We owe, we the Coast Guard, owe you all a great debt. It's no certainly surprise that the Coast Guard and ISBI has had a long-standing, mutually beneficial relationship. The Coast Guard 
has really been an advocate promoting and supporting ISBI throughout our large contingent members. And many of you kind of wearing those buttons today are active, especially in our armed forces chapter. As exemplified in this year's ISBI awards, where Coast Guard Training Center will invite uh, Captain Chris Hall excel. Um, in fact, probably too well <coughs> yesterday from what I heard. Uh, we will continue to submit our projects for consideration. Uh, our incredible people do really incredible work. And uh, I think this, uh, the recognition that they get is not only very rewarding, uh, but those awards also provide a great opportunity for our people to develop uh, themselves by presenting at conferences like this one. And lastly, uh, by submitting for consideration. It really keeps us honest. Uh, pushes us to learn to adhere to the tenets of performance technology, kind of puts some uh, meat behind uh, what oftentimes can be considered to be uh, too hollow of a piece, so it keeps us honest at the same time. Uh, as I mentioned to you probably to start with, uh, I just really consider myself to be a, a very simple sailor, uh, but I get HVT, I really do. Uh, it makes sense to me, and I think it makes sense to the Coast Guard. We get far more from HPT and ISPI, quite frankly, than we get back to. And certainly on behalf of the Coast Guard, uh, I thank you for all of your efforts to uh, supporting us so well during this uh, essentially three decade long affiliation with Sojourn. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, but I'd also be happy to just let you go out and have that cold beer big again from the great seafaring state of Wisconsin. I realize uh, in a Milwaukee kid, that's important. I'd be happy to try to answer the questions that you have. Uh, thank you again for your time today. Any like softball easy ones? Because I have a really smart people I can answer the hard ones. But nothing. I can feel the cold beer. One, one, one kind gentleman that's not that thirsty. Go ahead. Sir. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so having that opportunity, and then, uh, quite frankly, to be kind of trained up a little bit, again, as a, as a, as a common sailor in some of the HPT practices, and then be able to kind of very quickly get into graduate work. Uh, uh, it, it, was, it was a great opportunity, and, and again, had a very good team to, to assist us through that. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. But there's some commonality. 
we want to have that same doctrinal, hey, here's the, here's the highway we do this, here's how we treat uh, all of our fellow U.S. citizens with a great deal of respect, and, here's, and, and then also when I have to start working with those individuals, let's say border agencies, and I want to do something together, uh, I want to know that he or she is going to use that weapon or going to use that same use of force, the same as I do. You know, it's not one of those things where you go, oh, really, you guys are back. Um, not a good time to start learning that. You, know, you want to be able to do that at a very high doctrinal level. For all of us, is um, Customs and Border and others uh, have a, a lot of maritime and air assets. We want to be able to, you know, as taxpayers and unless the DHS, is look for the best efficiencies they can. So, again, not only in the way we train, but uh, looking at the rest of our assessment uh, doctrinal pieces. Uh, we are probably, quite frankly, just in the infancy, but uh, absolutely both as citizens and, and as taxpayers probably just as importantly, that's where we want to go as an organization. DOD, for instance, is very good at that. Um, you, you get a very much of uh, what we call a purple suitor now in DOD is the, the jointness that happens in DOD across all the forces, even though they're, uh, you know, Green might do something very different than an Air Force person. They understand a lot of the joint doctrine very well. We need to get there, quite frankly, with the Department of Homeland Security is to, is to become much more purple to get that joint doctrine. And that's, I think the Coast Guard is being recognized as a potential leader of that with the DHS. Thanks again for your time this afternoon. Uh, enjoy that dinner of beer. Except for I'm going to take one more question. <laughs> Thanks for again to ISBI for all that you've done for the coaster.
Thanks, Andrew.